My cousin Gene is a coin collector, and he gave me this token because he knew I was interested in family history. The SHV stands for Schleswig Holstein Verein, which was an early pioneer social club called the Dutch Hall. This is a five cent token, is probably 80 years old. I wondered how many times it bought a beer and who used it. It raised my curiosity and it took me on a journey to learn more about the Dutch Hall and my German heritage. I hope you enjoy what I learned. Early German Settlement, Schleswig Holstein Verein, and the Dutch Hall, a presentation of the Bennington Historical Society. Ever wonder who were the first pioneers who settled in eastern Nebraska? Actually, they came from all over the world, but the majority came from Europe and more specifically Germany. By 1910, people of German descent made up 57% of Omaha's population. We're going to examine a German community of pioneers who settled in northern Douglas and southern Washington counties. We'll examine what caused them to leave their European homes, what attracted them to this area, and the conditions they faced when they got here, and finally the legacy they left for future generations. Early settlers found good, rich farmland and shared the news with family and friends back in their former countries. Many of the Germans who settled in this area came from northern Germany from the state of Schleswig-Holstein. These Germans spoke Plaudeutsche, or Low German, which is a different dialect than High or Berlin German. Settlement here occurred as it did in other ethnic communities in Nebraska. It was far easier to settle with family, friends, or those who shared a similar language, religion, and traditions. Not many realized that church services in Bennington continued to be given in the German language until 1931. In those early days, immigrants had to show three things, a sponsor, a job, and a place to live before being allowed in this country. For instance, my great-granddad, Hans Johansson, was sponsored by the Gutch family. He immigrated and worked on the Gutch farm until he had saved enough to have his wife join him. Adolf Mueller, my grandfather, came over from Germany with his sister and brother and was sponsored by the Reverend Dirks in Auburn, Nebraska. Once they became established, they sponsored their parents to immigrate around 1910. This pattern created strong ethnic communities, not only for Germans, but also for Swedes, Danes, Czechs, Italians, Asians, and others. Immigrants faced many challenges and hardships by leaving home. They had to find and trust a sponsor. They had to sell nearly everything they owned, leave friends and family behind, travel across the Atlantic in a crowded ship, enter a strange country, and then travel hundreds of miles by horse, stage, wagon, train, and even some by foot to get to their destinations. What could have caused them to leave their European homes? Turmoil and war were two reasons. Schleswig and Holstein were actually two separate states at one time, Schleswig was located to the north next to Denmark and had a German minority. And Holstein was further south and had a German majority. Administration of this area was fought over in a series of wars among Denmark, Prussia, and Austria. That raged for nearly two decades between 1848 through 1864. War broke out again in 1870 between the Prussian-led German forces and the Second French Empire. This was the Franco-Prussian War, which helped cause the unification of Germany and paved the way for the ongoing hostility which led to World War I. Many people were simply tired of war and the uncertainty of being conscripted 
into armies that they may or may not support. Many choose to seek their fortune in this new country called America, the land of opportunity. This 1893 photograph shows some of the residents around Bennington celebrating the German victory in the Franco-Prussian War. This was the beginning of German nationalism. German immigrants, who were now Americans, still celebrated their German holidays, practiced their German language, German dances, and favorite foods and other cultural practices. Few Europeans could imagine, yet believe, a country would give away free land. But that was what was happening in this country after our Civil War. America was the land of opportunity, a place where you could not only start over, but start with something, and that was land. Land west of the Missouri River was Indian Territory until 1854. It was against the law to settle there. That changed with the signing of the Kansas-Nebraska Act in 1854 that made this Nebraska Territory. Some of the first farmland was given out as presidential land grants. For instance, the land where Bennington now sits was given to veterans of the War of 1812 in lieu of payment for their military service. Imagine that, soldiers fighting and not getting paid until after the war. Abraham Lincoln signed the Homestead Act of 1862, which accelerated the transfer of federal land and settlement. This act provided settlers 160 acres, provided they settled and made improvements on the land. The first homestead was in Nebraska, just south of us near Beatrice. Douglas Freeman, who was a Union soldier, took leave, and filed for his 160 acres in 1862. His homestead was the first in this country and triggered a rush of immigrants to the West. In 1936, the Schleswig-Holstein-Verden celebrated their 60th anniversary of the construction of the Dutch Hall. They asked Peter Soul, a resident of Blair, Nebraska, to speak at their celebration. He was also one of the last living charter members of the Dutch Hall. He described what it was like being a pioneer in the 1870s. His speech was printed in the Blair Pilot Tribune in 1936, nearly 80 years ago. Peter was 81 at the time when he shared the following memories. The farmers were very glad when they could get together and talk things over. They didn't have much machinery to speak of. You were safe almost any place in those years, especially on the highways, and you didn't hear of anyone being held up in Omaha. Everything goes fast now. I don't mean when they are working, but when they are sitting behind the wheel. You are hardly safe on the highway and are held up consistently in Omaha. Peter went on to describe the grasshopper plague this region experienced in the 1870s. He was 19 when he experienced his first encounter with the grasshoppers. I worked for a farmer near Irvington, Nebraska. I had to get water from an open well, and it was a little before noon. I couldn't see any sun, and it became very dark. I hurried to take the water to the house. I knew what was going to happen, for when I was a boy, I read the German Bible, and there it mentioned about locusts. When I ran out of the house, they still came down fast. Four or five flew onto my hat and chewed holes into it, and I could feel them on my head. I don't get cold feet very easily, but I wanted to leave this country, if they were going to migrate in and settle. The cattle and the horse didn't get water. If a farmer had a fresh cow, it had to be milked on the ground, and trains became stalled on the tracks because the grasshoppers were so thick. The housekeeper had mosquito cloth covered over my windows, and the grasshoppers went through that and settled in my shanty. I could go to bed, 
but would have to use a stool for a bed. What a terrible sight. A night I shall never forget. The next day, a little after twelve o'clock, they migrated on, except the cripples and those that were in the well. My boss still got forty-five bushels an acre from his corn, and I had a chance to keep my job. Peter went on to reminisce about farming and even the plight of women in those early years. The farmers were gl very glad when they could get together and talk things over. They didn't have much machinery to speak of. Now think of us when we had to farm by hand. I plowed with oxen, planted eight acres of corn with a hand planter, made 19 miles over the loose ground. We always had a lot of pep in us because we got up early in the morning and always retired at the same time each day. The farmers only had small houses and no barns to speak of. They wanted a public place so they could get together and talk. It seems as if the women were just as much interested as the men. So they could have a chance to get together and have a social talk. Several fellows and I went to Omaha and Miller to attend dances. The people had to go to Calhoun to get the mail. Just think of your grandmothers. I feel sorry for them yet. When the wives came home from the field, they had to make supper and put the children to bed. If they didn't have candles, they put grease into a causer and put a wick into that. They didn't have any sewing machines. They had to make their children's clothes by hand. Now you jump into the car, step on the gas, and go to town to bring home ready-made clothes for your children. Doris Hoyer grew up on a farm just west of Bennington. She remembers, When I was a little girl, Mom and Dad and my older brother would pick corn by hand. The team would slowly pull the wagon while each took a roll and carefully picked each ear and threw them into the wagon. My brother Warren and I were too young to help, so we had to ride in the wagon. Normally we stayed under the seat so we wouldn't get hit, but sometimes we got to playing and forgot, and getting hit with an ear of corn really hurts. Peter also talked about the events that led up to the establishment of the German cemetery and the building of the Dutch Hall nearly 140 years ago. The Verein did a wise thing when they started the German cemetery. Before, they always had to go to Calhoun, which was a hard task. The means of transportation were not very easy, as they had to use wagons and buggies. Some farmers didn't have spring seats, so they had to use boards, which were very uncomfortable. It was also very dangerous to travel this way because of the large blizzards, which were customary at that time. We had a chance to get two acres where the hall is now located. In February 1876, several men drew up a petition and 44 members signed. Each had to pay $25 by November 1st. Ferdinand Peters, across the Sarpy County line, loaned the members $1,600 with which they built the hall. Hans Breckenfield obtained a contract to build it. Some farmers went to Omaha and hauled out enough lumber to build it. It was almost finished by July 4th when they held the opening day. We had planted trees 8 to 10 feet high and 3 grew. The place was nice and clean. I sure did my share to help. Dorothy Weiss, a longtime member, added, the German Hall, also known as Dutch Hall, as it became known all over the county, was located in southern Washington County, Nebraska. It once was the gathering place for the Schleswig Holstein Viren, an active rural group with members from northern Douglas County and southern Washington County. In 1876, a group of German farmers in the Dornicker School District decided to build a hall which could serve as their social center. Adolf H. Stephan, leased two acres of land to the Viren for 99 years rent-free. The group elected Henry Schnecker, their president, Rudolf Peters, the secretary, and manager Charles Gutch, the treasurer. 
The building was 12 feet by 30 feet, and it had one of the best maple dance floors anywhere in the country. It became the country club of the organizers and their children. It was a place for dances, birthday celebrations, anniversaries, and an occasional funeral. Attendance of any gathering at the hall was always a must for everyone in the neighborhood. There was at least one dance per month, and sometimes more, too. The hall was eventually enlarged, and this is the final floor plan. The main entrance faced toward the south. As you entered, the kitchen was to your left, and the bar was to your right. The primary beverage was keg beer. Straight ahead was the dance floor. It was surrounded with benches and had a recess for the bandstand. Wood stoves were on either side of the dance floor, and of course, the kitchen stove heated that corner of the building. Originally, lighting came from candles and kerosene lanterns, and later there was electricity. There was a small upstairs that was accessed from outside that had two rooms and a balcony that overlooked the dance floor. The small rooms served as nurseries where small children napped on blankets or their parents' coats. Restroom facilities were primitive because there wasn't any running water. There wasn't even a well. Water was hauled in in milk cans. The ladies were provided a pit toilet and the men were provided a back door in the outside. Their outhouse had walls to accommodate several gentlemen, but it didn't have a roof. Dorothy recounted an early event. On July 4th, 1886, the Army Band from Fort Omaha played at the hall. This was a real treat because the members of the Viren only went to Omaha on very special businesses at that time. The band made the trip in Army wagons and arrived about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and then they played for a dance that evening. The band traveled in three big wagons pulled by four mules each. One wagon hauled the band, another wagon hauled the instruments in the tents, and the other one was for the commissary, which provided the food for the men and the feed for the mules. They camped on the grounds and returned the following day. The first golden anniversary was for Henry Schneider's parents. The hall continued to grow in popularity. After a few years, it had to be enlarged. After this was completed, more people were coming to attend. The Viren charged their friends admission to the affairs there. German Hall became the political center, and election dances both before and after elections. Politicians soon found that they could contact many voters at the hall and spent money there. Sometime road shows stopped there to entertain, too. One of the annual celebrations was Whitsun, or Pink Sun, which was the seventh Sunday after Easter. This was a family celebration. Children would celebrate Pinkston or Whit Sunday in the afternoon. The girls had a bird which was attached to a rope which they would aim at a certain target. The goal was to knock over the target. The boys had to shoot a bird target that sat on a pole outside. The bird had several parts like the body, the head, and tail that represented different points. The gun was cocked and it would propel a wooden bullet that would knock down the bird or a portion of it. Scores were kept, and the winners were crowned king and queen. Later they gave out prizes, and they would march around the hall to music. Bob Dornacker remembers the worst thing about Whit Sunday when he was a boy was that he had to dance with a girl. The Dutch Hall was a place where you learned to dance and met kids your own age. Many of those early dances led to marriages. Dorothy went on to describe those festivities. A lot of people would bring picnic baskets full of lunch to eat outside on the tables. At night, there would be a dance for grown-ups with an orchestra playing the Flying Dutchman, polkas, waltzes, and Scottish, a German dance. They would put the small children upstairs to sleep until the grown-ups were ready to go home. The third generation witnessed what was once a tight German community disband. Their children had become Americanized and society was rapidly changing. Modern cars and better roads provided greater mobility and the younger folks had more and fancier places to go for entertainment. 
Quite honestly, they didn't have to tolerate the muddy roads or primitive facilities they found at the Dutch Hall. They could go dance at Offs Hall, Dankers Hall, the Primrose and Millard, and they had a dozen other night spots. By 1962, only 16 members were left in the Verdon. The building was sold and moved, and the land went back to Harry Fetty, from whose farm it had originally been leased. Within German communities, it was common to find Low German clubs, or Plaudetscher Vereins. These clubs had chapters nationwide. One still exists in Watertown, Wisconsin, which was founded in 1882. This photograph was taken of a Plaudetscher Verein convention, which was held in South Omaha around 1900. These clubs formed to perpetuate the German language, especially the Plaudetscher dialect. Early membership was restricted to men who could read and speak the German language. Membership also included a death benefit. When a member died, local businesses would collect one dollar from each living member. This helped the family cover funeral expenses. Henry and Lamar Eiche were members of the local Plaudetscher Verein when it was disbanded in 2011. Lamar shares some of her early memories of the Verein. The Bennington Plaudetscher Social Benefit Verein was organized in the mid-1930s. Each member paid $3 to join, and then they were assessed $1 at the time of a member's death. The money given to the family. Monthly meetings and social events were held for many years. By the 1950s there was a waiting list to join as the membership was limited to 499 members. But as years went by social times changed and in the late 1980s membership was starting to decline. By a vote of the members, women were allowed to join the all-male organization. The membership grew, but not enough. In the early 2000s, an amendment to the bylaws was proposed, voted on, and approved to allow the group to dissolve once membership dropped to 100 or less. In 2011, the organization was dissolved. The last board members were Marlon Kors, President, Lou Ward, Vice President, and Henry Ike served as Secretary and Treasurer. Today all evidence of the Dutch Hall is gone except for its name that marks the County Line Road separating Douglas and Washington counties. However, the vestiges of those hard-working pioneers can still be found at the German cemetery. All four sets of my great-grandparents the Mullers, the Johansons, the Offs, and the Gordons are buried within 50 yards of each other there. While putting this presentation together, my wife and I visited their grave sites, and I couldn't help but think of the hardship, hard work, camaraderie, and the community those early pioneers once shared. I have no doubt that all my great grandparents danced on that maple floor drank beer from those kegs, laughed, sang, and celebrated life, celebrated family and friends at the Dutch Hall. And who knows, possibly one of them even used this brass token. Lyle Sass played Peter Soule. Kalita Logeman played Dorothy Weiss. Linda Mueller played Doris Hoyer. And I'm Gordon Mueller. Special thanks goes to Dorothy Weiss, the Blair Pilot Tribune, Donna Morton, Lamar and Henry Ike, and Bob Dornacker, and all those others who shared stories about the Dutch Hall. Thank you very much.